Thank you, Iftikhar. And thank you, Diana, as well as Mustafa, for inviting us to rethink, Ambed uh, to rethink Kumar Swami. And um, my paper is called From Kumar Swami to Ambedkar, Politicizing Indian Art History. For many years now, I've been engaged in the pursuit of writing art history against the grain. In today's paper, I will historically contextualize the arts crafts debate by introducing the figure of Ambedkar in this narrative and arguing for the application of a social justice perspective to the discipline of art history. Such a perspective, such a perspective would produce a domino effect prompting us to reread the consensual accounts related to this debate. But to do so, I would need to pedal back into the past and negotiate a genealogy of perspectives that bear strongly on the categories of the folk, the tribal, the rural, the national, and the modern, all of which have shaped our discourse about what, constitu what constitutes the contemporary in post-colonial Indian cultural production. Certain tropes and figures, sites and themes recur in this discourse. The village, the figure of the artisan, folk, tribal, and authenticity. Um, some of these images that I'll be showing you in relation to these tropes, uh, this is a Haripura poster by Nanlal Bose, made in 1938. And these posters were uh, made at the, uh, at the invitation uh, of um, Gandhi, who uh, asked Bose to make uh, works uh, for the Indian Congress session at Haripura in Gujarat. Uh, and Gandhi believed that it's very important for the people who uh, visit these sessions to uh, learn about the importance of the rural and artisanal traditions. So Bose, uh, who's a Shantiniketan artist, he improvises a new language whereby, where he uh, mixes together ajanta frescoes and kaligat pats. So here we have the trope of the village. The village regarding, regarded variously as a site of native and pre-modern authenticity, pre-industrial backwardness or cultural wholeness. The figure of the artisan, variously conceived as an organic bearer of holistic cultural values, a poor relation to the metropolitan and academy-trained artist. The folk, as the pre-national repository of collective consciousness that assured its members of identity and belonging in a locale. The tribal championed as a subaltern victim deserving of developmental assistance or idealized as a cultural subject rooted in the specificities of a local environment. And lastly, authenticity. This is an image um, from 2017, uh, last year. Uh, it's, uh, the protest is called Not, Not In My Name, which happened in Bombay and elsewhere in India. And it was, uh, it, was, uh, it was made in response to the lynchings of the members of the Muslim community as well as the Dalit community. Uh, the term authenticity that persists as an anxiety in this discourse, uh, as such it becomes the ground of claims exerted by numerous forces, including the Hindu right wing, aggressive modernizers, resurrectionists of the crafts, and progressively oriented thinkers who wish to invest contemporary artists emerging from these backgrounds with agency. Why I have this image here will become clearer uh, in a, uh, you know, for us as I, uh, you know, uh, as I proceed through this presentation. Therefore, I would like to, visit, to revisit a series of debates staged across the 20th century in India and which involved such participants as the cultural historians and ideologues, E.B. Havel, Kumar Swami, and the political and cultural thinkers, M.K. Gandhi, Rabindranath Tagore, and B.R. Ambedkar. In doing so, I would like to demonstrate that the debate over subaltern art is both about an aesthetic self-assertion and a choice of artistic form, as well as a demand for the redistribution of social equity and a securing of participatory citizenship for India's subaltern communities. 
Let me take you back to the originary moment um, uh, you know, in history, uh, which is related to this debate. And the date here is 1905. It's synonymous with the announcement of the Swadeshi movement in Bengal, which received in intellectual support from Rabindranath, Rabindranath Tagore, Abhanandranath, and Gaganendranath Tagore, as well as E.B. Havel, Kumar Swami, and Sister Nivedita. The Swadeshi movement, which began as a protest against the 1905 partition of Bengal along communal lines by Lord Curzon, became a rallying point for the Indian nationalists of the period. Abhanandranath Tagore painted Bangamata, Mother by Bengal, a sannyasi mother image that drew on Bankim Chandra, Bankim Chandra Chattopadhyay's proto-nationalist proto novel, Anand for, Anand for inspiration. Within a few years, the image would be rechristened and redistributed nationally as Bharat Mata. Rabindranath promoted Hindu-Muslim unity, encouraging citizens to defy the religion-based East-West partition of Bengal. Havel had already begun to uh, uh, propose the ideas about the philosophical self-sufficiency of the traditional Indic cultural economy, as well as the pre-colonial and pre-modern economic systems of the Indian village. Kumar Swami was developing his conception of Indian civilization as an entity based on abiding spiritual values embodied in the continuities of sculpt uh, scriptural, text te textual, mythological, and didactic traditions. Largely peaceful until 1908, the Swadeshi movement passed after that date into the hands of extremist agitators who were described as terrorists in those days. It grew correspondingly more violent. With the onset of the second phase, Kumar Swami, the Tagores, and their associates retreated from active involvement with the nationalist movement and moved towards a more, more reflective engagements with the ideas of moral reformation and cultural renaissance. Indeed, the origins of Indian cultural nationalism lie in this shift. Especially in the works of Havel and Kumar Swami, we may discern an uh, intimate relationship amongst uh, five themes. The idea of the Indic civilization as a primordially rooted and perennially flowering entity interrupted by colonial rule and its industrializing and modernizing tendencies. The idea of a truly Indian culture independent of all foreign influences. An emerging national identity based on these premises and therefore, so to speak, spiritually as well as materially opposed to Western influence. A new art that had to be ex uh, expressive was of such a national sensibility and yet assert its claim to a specific modernity. And an art pedagogy that could articulate such an art um, uh, and uh, that could articulate such an art and infuse students with its spirit. As speculation became certainty, strategy became dogma, and doctrine became knowledge, the cluster of ideas associated with Havel Kumar Swami were to underwrite many of the confusions that the Indian cultural sector was to experience throughout the 20th century. I have in mind particularly the persistent concerns with Indianness, authenticity, and nativism, which were to plague Indian visual artists and writers between the 50s and the 90s. On the other hand, a number of the key conceptions floated by Havel Kumar Swami were to find their way into mainstream nationalist discourse once they were adapted by Gandhi. While Havel and Kumar Swami tended to emphasize uh, elite conceptions of culture, they saw high classical culture and folk culture as organically related within the web of social and economic relationships sustained by customs and obligations prevailing in pre-colonial culture. As an ideologue, Havel was preoccupied with defining a truly Hindu, culture, a truly Hindu cultural paradigm. This led him to overemphasize the authenticity of pre-Islamic Indian art and to, uh, to, and to deride Indo-Islamic art as a derivative. This was an ahistorical error. The strength of Indo-Islamic art lies in its syncretic and confluential versat versatility. It is not derived from Safavi or Ottoman or Mamluk um, exemplars. Any strength that he noted in Mughal architecture was promptly credited to some indwelling Hindu characteristics absorbed into the, into the form. 
in a handbook of Agra and the Taj, Sikandra, Fatehpur, Sikri, and the neighborhood in 1904, for instance, Havel speaks of the distinctive Indian character of Mughal architecture. So again, if, uh, you know, if, if you look at this Fatehpur Sikri image, uh, it is based on the Mughal Charbagh um, design, but at the same time, it has the Chatri. So what you're seeing again is uh, the confluence of both these elements of, of Indo-Islamic art. It's not one versus the other, but uh, when Havel the ideologue speaks over Havel the art historian, then art and art history gets distorted. Tapti Guha Thakurta notes that uh, Havel's strategy was to, and I quote her, separate the Persian influences from a central underlying core of Hindu features in construction and in ornament details. Implicitly Hindu became synonymous with being genuinely Indian. Curiously, Havel ignored the fact that the various forms of Hindu art are themselves highly variegated owing their emergence to incessant cultural and technical confluence. As a student and documenter of specific forms, Havel was attentive to detail, but as a proto-nationalist ideologue, he ignored facts in favor of programs. As an educator, Havel's achievements were more constructive. He promoted classes in decorative design, a fresco, stained glass painting, etc., over the imitative portraiture based on academic painting taught in the Indian schools of art. Uh, the Indian schools of art was set up uh, by the British in India in, uh, in, in the 1850s. Secondly, he sought to Indianize the fine arts. He promoted Abhinindranath Tagore and the, st uh, and the study of uh, in miniature paintings as an indigenous cultural expression. Thirdly, he managed to work outside the art academy to promote handloom weaving. He set up independent cooperatives. Uh, he set up in independent cooperatives to ensure the economic independence of weavers. Havel linked the issue of handloom work to the issue of national culture. Regarding the impoverishment of the weavers and the sub subjugation by industrial manufacture as a sign of cultural impoverishment. Kumar Swami too had a, cult uh, a cultural nationalist agenda that conflated the Indic with the Hindu and a more constructive of equally elitist conception of the importance of the artisan to culture. A prominent example of the former tendency in his work is the skewed account of Kushan art with, uh, for, between the first and the fourth century AD. The Kushan empire had two capital regions, Gandhara in the west, uh, that's your present day uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan, and Mathura in the east, in present day Uttar Pradesh. Both these form the two major poles of Kushan culture. The art of Gandhara demonstrates continuity with the art of the Roman Orient, which is today's uh, Turkey, Syria, Jordan, Palestine. Um, and if you just look at this image, you realize that it's, it's obvious that uh, Apollo, Zeus, and Hermes prototypes were used to represent the Bodhisattvas and the Buddhas of Gandhara. Uh, so this is the Bodhisattva Maitre uh, from the Kushan uh, Gandhara uh, uh, style uh, from the 2nd century AD. And it is the first time in, in the Kushan period that the Buddha appears in a human form. Before that, the Buddha would appear in a non-iconic form, just uh, you know, through the representation of the footprints or the tree or the lotus or the chakra. In the first century, when the Kushans uh, are, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the first century, when the Kushans uh, had established themselves, there was an influx of artisans, uh, styles, techniques from the Roman Orient. And the sculptors of the Roman Orient, um, you know, uh, they, who, who were used to making Apollo or Hermes, made new iconic forms of the Buddha in the style of the Greek gods. In Mathura, uh, what we find is, uh, on the other hand, that there, there is actually a continuity with the more local sculptural traditions of figuration, with the yaksha figures developed in the Gangetic region. And um, 
uh, this uh, uh, this is again a Mathura Buddha, and um, it's, uh, it's 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 uh, showing uh, the Buddha with the Bodhisattva as uh, his attendants, and um, the basis of the of this Buddha figure is the yaksha form. But even as um, you know, you you are seeing, seeing this Mathura style Buddha, what you have is the nimbus on top with the angels, and again here, therefore, what you are seeing is the Persian influence. Um, so, um, the, the Kumar Swami um, uh, used the distinction between Gandhara and the Mathura styles, um, and um, it, and sorry. So, so Kumar Swami used uh, this distinction to claim uh, that the Mathura style was more rooted, authentic, and a true national style, while Gandharva was derivative, alien, and non-authentic. This was a peculiar argument, coming as it did from the son of a Sinhalese uh, Tamil Brahmin father and, uh, in, and an English mother who straddled cultures. Such ideological biases, which downplay the confluential aspects of Indian culture, continue to resonate in nativistic Hindu right-wing thought today. While they, while, uh, while, uh, while they constructed strategies of resistance to the power of industry and empire, Kumar Swami and Havel also generated a cultural nationalism ultimately premised on the idea of a Hindu India. To the evolving discourse of cultural nationalism, Kumar Swami was uh, also contributed to the figure of the orig uh, oriental artisan, the Shilpin, an idealized figure who's seen to perpetuate a, a tradition of study and making, producing his images and artifacts anonymously and in accordance with well-codified Shilpa Shastras. Kumar Swami emphasized text over practice, thereby engen engendering the idea that the most vital art practices were those which conformed to ideas already enshrined in guiding texts with no place uh, for innovation or improvisation. In this account, the creative personality counts for little in the face of the received idea. Parenthetically, it should be noted that there has been a curious split in the Havel Kumar Swami legacy. With them, cultural nationalism and a concern with subaltern cultural agency went together. Over the 20th century, the former became the mandate of the right and the, the latter became the inheritance of the left. This is Gandhi by Nandlal Bose again. Um, Havel and Kumar Swami's ideas flowed into the work of Gandhi, who entered Indian politics in 1915. The Charkha, now universally identified with Gandhi, was originally raised to public consciousness by Havel, who marked it out as a symbol of self-sufficiency in his writings for the, for the Hindu. Gandhi also carried forward the argument that the craft sector could be the stage for resistance against industry and empire and, thus, uh, and that making one's own cloth could serve as a dramatization of agency um, as against enslavement. Swaraj or Swarajya, a concept that B.G. Uh, Tilak and Dadabhai Navroji had previously nuanced in terms of political and economic self-determination, was inflected in more philosophical terms, both by Kumar Swami and Gandhi, who saw it as the regulation of the individual self, which would then influence the transformation of society. Kumar Swami, Rabindranath Tagore, and, a, and to a considerable extent, Gandhi were all influenced by the arts and crafts movement, whose key leaders were the art critic, social visionary, and educator John Ruskin, and the poet, artist, designer, and cultural entrepreneur William Morris. Now I'm overlapping on Iftikhar's presentation here. The arts and crafts movement was a late 19th century left romantic critique of industrialism, which regarded industrial capital and machine-based uh, manufacture as essentially dehumanizing. As against these, the movement valued the production of the handmade artifact over the machine-made one. A certain medievalism inflected this movement. It upheld a romantic vision of a pre-industrial society where art and life were contiguous and not divorced from each other, and human agency, rather than the dehumanizing force of industrial capital, was the motive energy of social relationships. 
Accordingly, Ruskin, based on his commitment to Christian socialism, became one of the earliest promoters of the Working Men's College, which provided liberal education to Victorian skilled artisans, while Morris founded the Kempscott Press and revived traditional textiles. Significantly, Kumar Swami's book, Medieval Sinhalese Art, 1908, on the destruction of craftsmanship in uh, uh, South Asia, appeared under the Kempscott imprint. Gandhi, Tagore, and Kumar Swami tended to view the city as a site of contamination. As against the colonial industrial centers of Bombay, Calcutta, and Madras, these thinkers romanticized the self-sufficient village as, as the true site from which the anti-colonial struggle was to be launched. Gandhi saw utopian hope in the pragmatic synergies and rooted traditions of India's village republics. Tagore, for his part, uh, had an Arcadian vision of the village. Indeed, he bypassed the village altogether and saw the countryside as the lo locale for a forest hermitage. In his experimental university, Shanti Niketan, the abode of peace, he idealized the forest as a retreat and a sanctuary. Tagore felt that the contamination of the urban could be undone through contact with the more natural and intuitive life world of the Santal tribal community. Gandhi, of course, borrowed the idea of the village republic from Charles Metcalfe, the British scholar administrator who conceived of ancient India as a patchwork of self-governing villages, each sufficient within itself. In fact, the villages of ancient India were never self-sufficient and could not have been. Rather, they were at various times richly interconnected by the great transcontinental trade routes, the Uttarapath and the Dakshinapath, as well as the feeder routes of the Silk, uh, of the silk Road, and the, and the trade that connected Rome, South India, and Southeast Asia. India's villages, far, f far from being isolated, were part of a multiple sacred and um, uh, secular economies of circulation, linking shrines, pilgrim centers, markets, and towns. These interdependencies were interrupted and destroyed by the colonial restructuring of geography and the industrial reformatting of distribution, of distribution networks. As for Tagore, his Arcadian approach translated as a receptiveness of urban artists to tribal culture, but not as a converse redemption of the tribal community from their immiseration. As the artist K.G. Subramaniam has, as, as, has astutely observed, while the Tagores, and I quote him, while the Tagores were more concerned with the living environment, the contact they advocated with this was remote and contemplative, combining a poetic empathy into things with an emotional aristocracy, close quote. It was left to Ambedkar to inject a necessary and corrective realism into the trope of the village in the nationalist discourse of the late colonial period. By the 1930s, two powerful and contending visions of the, fu of fu of the future India, Gandhi's and Ambedkar's, dominated the arena of political action with respect to the asymmetry between elite and subaltern groups under the rubric of caste. During this period, elitist ideas about the arts and crafts, the village republic, um, untouchability were debated with far greater attention to the ground reality rather than through utopian and Arcadian perspectives. All the protagonists of this account so far were privileged members and beneficiaries of the imperial colonial ascendancy who nevertheless opposed the effects of empire on principle, Havel, Kumaraswamy, Tagore, and Gandhi. Unlike these men, B.R. Ambedkar emerged from the opposite end of Indian society, from the milieu of the most oppressed and impoverished, the so-called untouch untouchable castes of the time. Rising through effort and merit, he became one of the most highly educated Indians of his time, having imbibed the traditions of liberal constitutionalism and rationalism in the UK and the USA. He developed an unyielding and systematic critique of Gandhi's program of paternalistic reform and his romantic and Metcalf-inspired notions of the Indian village and village life. Arguing for separate political representation for the depressed caste, whom he would later called the Dalits, or the ground-down ones, as against Gandhi's more gentler term for them, the Harijans, or the wards of God. Um, 
Ambedkar forcefully rejected Gandhi's fiduciary notions, his belief that the lower caste could be placed under the trusteeship of the upper caste. To him, the only means of securing agency to subaltern groups was an emancipation that could be fought for through, uh, that could be fought through, uh, that, that could be fought for through by triple means: education, organization, and agitation. To this end, he declared that the so-called untouchables were not Hindu at all, but formed a separate constituency. Having been subjected to apartheid level segregation, they would regard themselves as definitively apart. He subjected the Metcalf Gandhi vision of the Indian village to a withering attack as a key move in his emancipatory rhetoric. Speaking at the All India Depressed Classes Conference in 1942, he declared that the village, far from being a romantic site of harmony, was a site of structural violence. And I quote Ambedkar, you have spread out all over India some seven lakh Hindu villages. Attached to every Hindu village, there exists a small settlement of untouchables. It is invariably a settlement of landless population. Being untouchable, it could not sell anything, for nobody would buy from an untouchable. It is wholly a population destitute and dependent for its livelihood upon the Hindu village. It lives by begging for food or by offering its labor for a paltry village. The village system must therefore be broken." Close quote. In counterpoint, Ambedkar proposed the creation of separate villages meant only for the Dalits, where they could be given their own land to cultivate and would achieve a measure of dignity and self-reliance. Ambedkar thus enacted a major ontological and an epistemological rupture in the discourse of nationalism by revealing the neutral ground of nationalist self-definition to be, in fact, defined by caste and its class correlative and also by displacing identity-oriented inquiries into social and cultural self-knowledge with an inquiry founded in a social justice perspective. In conclusion, I'd like to emphasize that we must adopt an Ambedkarite position in our relationship to the subaltern arts, not an aestheticized, mythopoeic, or a transcendentalist perspective, but rather one that emerges from the discourse of civil rights, a discourse that creates space for the assertion of political, social, and cultural representation. This paper is dedicated to the memory of Jangar Singh Sham, who died in 2001. He lived proudly as one who had made a remarkable transition from tribal obscurity to national and international renown. As a young man, he was invited by the artist Swaminathan to Bharat Bhavan, a transdisciplinary space in Bhopal where folk and contemporary art galleries were exhibited in adjacency to each other. Here, Jangar Singh Sham involved into an accomplished artist inventing his own style, which Udayan Vajpayee has called the Jangar Kalam. Um, his work was shown in major exhibitions, like the Magicians de la Terre exhibition in Paris in 1989, um, as well as the Other Masters uh, exhibition curated by Jutindra Jain in 1998. Despite such commendable achievements, he died tragically while on a residency at the Mithila Museum in Japan. Before he died or had been driven to his death, he had written to his wife that he was extremely unhappy and desperately wanted to return home. But his passport had been withheld by the museum, forcing him to commit suicide. He, uh, and, 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 the, and the director of the museum, Hasegawa, actually, when, when he died and, 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 the, and, and the wife and children, they wanted the body to be brought back, Hasegawa crudely said that he hadn't budgeted for Jangar's body to be returned to his family in Bhopal. Such gross exploitation of a so-called folk or tribal artist would be unheard of, or unheard of in the contemporary art context. Jangar Singh Sham and that of his fellow artists uh, reminds us urgently that the old arts crafts debate is still being fought in the battlefield between the Havel Kumaraswamy civilizational zeitgeist on the one hand and the Ambedkarite rights discourse on the other. But I do not wish to end on a pessimistic note. My paper has two endings. So here is another scenario. Let me introduce you to the work of the Buster-based artist Rajkumar. While he had trained under the master craftsperson uh, Rethuram, uh, an invitation from uh, the Bombay-based artist Navjot Altaf to participate in a collaborative art project set him free to assert his own artistic subjectivity. 
Navjot, Rajkumar, Shantibai, and people from the village of Kondagao came together to build themselves a dialogue center, a center that could be appropriately called a third space, which is neither based on governmental assistance nor NGO munificence. A third space that functions as an assembly for people from across the caste, class, and tribal community spectrum, and which perhaps, uh, you know, only art can make possible. The dialogue center included spaces for art making as well as for discussions. By not overprivileging studio practice and giving equal importance to making art and the discursive, this infrastructure of dissent enabled organic intellectuals like Rajkumar, Shantibai, Ganga, and others to speak, their, to speak in their own voices alongside the village school teacher, the bureaucrat, the middleman, the activists. And this feat would have been impossible under normal circumstances. At one of the symposiums, I asked Rajkumar how he had customized the term collaborative art so that he could respond to the specific circumstances. I remember Ming Tiampo asking us, you know, I mean, whether we'd like to invent new words and uh, new vocabularies. Uh, I did not want to merely reiterate what Grant Kester or Mivon Kwon had said about dialogic or co uh, community art. Rajkumar told me that he was, um, in, uh, you know, uh, comfortable with the English word collaboration. Uh, sorry, Rajkumar told me that he was not comfortable with the English word collaboration and that the Hindi term kala sahyog, which is actually more cooperation, cooperation rather than collaboration, was equally remote, even alienating. Instead, he preferred the dialect word baithya, which comes from his language halbi, which means a neighborly cooperation or barter exchange. Soon, th soon though, in the course of the conversation, Rajkumar set aside both the bureaucraties of Kalasa Hyog and the customary usage of baithya as discursively insufficient. Instead, he developed a neologism that would convey the active sense of their experimental practice. Akkal bata bati, the exchange and sharing of intelligence, the coming together of techne and news. Thank you.